Hello, everyone. Looks like we have a few people here. So hi, my name is Laura. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first, I just want to thank you for being here today with me. Looks like someone else just joined. So maybe we'll give it a second. See if anyone else comes in. So my name is Laura. Um, I want to thank you for being here with me today. I want to thank the Bright Start Foundation as well and everyone who put this together. Um, we're all grateful to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. I'm really excited to be reaching you in your homes today. Um, I know we've all been stuck at home in different ways um, due to all that's happening in the world right now. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to bring some art into your homes today. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about ways to be creative with photography um, in your home, with your family. Hopefully it will spark your curiosity, um, give you some projects and ideas to get started making images together. Um, hopefully we'll be really playful and we'll have some fun. Um, so I'm going to slow, show a slideshow. Um, so I'm going to get started with that and we'll talk through it. Oh, also, I can't see you today. I can't hear you. Um, but, you know, I'm looking forward to engaging with you. Um, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A, the chat box. Um, and I'll talk about that. We'll get to that. So welcome again. This is Photography in the Family, Creative Image Making with Your Child. This is the first part of a two-part webinar, um, but you can choose to attend either without attending the other. It'll just create a fuller experience if you also attend the next one. So my name is Laura, as I said. Um, this is a little bit about me. So I'm an artist and an art therapist. I'm based in New York City in the United States. Um, I have about five years experience with youth with disabilities in art museums and schools, um, working in art therapy for the last several years. I've worked a lot with families, um, creating families who are looking to bond and connect through the arts. So that's what I'm the lens I'm looking at things through when I'm creating projects for you to do at home. I'm thinking, how can you how can we create moments of connection with these art processes? So not focusing on what is perf, not focusing on perfect art or really even what our children's art looks like, but just focusing on the moments of connecting together through these artworks. I've also been a photographer for more than a decade. So I take my own photos. Um, I work mostly in portraiture. Um, which means I take photos of people. That's what portraiture means. Um, and I have found it really exciting to combine the fields of photo and art therapy. Um, it's not, art photo is sort of not as commonly used in the art therapy world um, because I think that people just, there's just not a lot of experience with it. Um, but I think that photo is an extremely accessible um, art form that we use every day. Um, so being able to use it in creative ways with your child um, are really important because we're using photo all the time, we're exposed to it a lot. And lastly, I believe art is for everyone. We can use art every day to connect with each other. Um, and on that note, uh, I want to encourage you when I'm going through this presentation, I wanna encourage you to imagine ways that you might be able to adapt um, the projects to suit your needs, your child's needs um, and abilities. So, um, you know, there, there's a way to adapt pretty much anything, I, I believe, to suit different children, different families, um, and if, you are, if you need some support imagining those adaptations, please 
um, ask in the comments in the Q and A, um, and I can answer them at the end, thinking through ideas of ways we could adapt projects to your specific needs. So just to get on the same page, um, I'm going to give you the rough outline for today's webinar so we know sort of where we're going with this. So today we are going to look at works of art. The first thing we're going to do is look at works of art by different photographers. I've chosen two photographers for today. Um, and this will serve as inspiration for the art activities that we're going to cover a little bit later. Um, we're also going to identify things in those photographs that we can use in our own art making. And then we're going to explore ideas and prompts to get started making photographs together. Oh, and again, please ask questions at any time during the webinar, typing in the chat box and we'll answer them. I'll be able to answer them at the end. Please don't be shy. No question is too big or too small. So because photography is a technical medium, um, we'll discuss equipment really quick. Um, I am imagining all of these projects with a phone camera. It doesn't have to be a phone camera. If you have a regular camera and that is what you want to use or that's what your family is used to using, you are totally welcome to use your cameras. Um, I have imagined these projects with phone cameras in mind, specifically because we have our phones, our smartphones with us all the time and they have cameras on them. And we take pictures I know I at least take pictures all the time. And these aren't necessarily creative photos, but I'm taking pictures all the time. So I think that children see us using these, these, these cameras all the time. They, we take photos of the children, we take photos throughout our daily lives. Um, so using your phone can actually be really um, exciting because your child gets to use this thing that you always use. Um, and it's probably really interesting to them. And it's an art, it's an art tool that you actually have with you all the time. So, you know, you don't have crayons, you don't have markers with you, but you do have a, you do have a camera, you do have photo equipment, you are carrying this art technology all the time. So I kind of just said this, but you know, in today's age, we make photographs all the time. We take pictures of artwork to remember it, to share it. We take pictures of our children. We take pictures of ourselves, you know, the common selfie. Um, we take pictures of our accomplishments or special events in our lives. So there are many, many types of photographs um, and we are inundated with them in today's age. Technology has advanced so much that we see so many images all the time, we might not even really stop and think about what we're looking at. We're just kind of consuming them a lot or taking a lot of pictures. But um, so yeah, lots of photos all over the place. Um, and today we're gonna focus on one type of photograph. So we're gonna focus on portraits. Portrait is a photograph of a person, pretty simple. Um, so today we're gonna talk about making portraits together with your child in creative ways, especially while we're all stuck at home and we need some more um, things to do. We need some more ideas. So right now, we're going to look at four images, one by one. We'll look at four images um, made by two different artists and we're gonna talk about the artworks that we see. I'm actually gonna go back for a second. We're gonna talk about the artworks that we see as soon as we see them. Um, I think that taking photographs begins with the act of noticing, the act of observing something, and then choosing to document it, choosing to um, save that moment that you noticed. So at first, the way that we're going to honor that practice of just noticing and documenting is we're going to look at four photographs, um, one by one, and I just want you at home to say what you notice. I know that I can't hear you, um, but if you are sitting there with your child um, or whoever you're 
viewing this with today um, for children. You know, you're, maybe you're sitting there with your grown up, your parent. Um, I want you to just think about what you notice. I'll ask some questions while we look at the photos and um, just have a discussion. Um, if you want to, if you feel uncomfortable having a discussion about it, you can just think about the questions for yourselves. I'm going to leave little pauses so we can just kind of think together. Um, yeah, so just observe for this first moment and then we'll talk about ways to actually um, make creative portraits using what we've observed, okay? So this is a photograph. This is the first of four. This is a photograph by the photographer Hassan Hajaj. Um, I would like you to look at this image and say the first thing that comes to mind. Just think about what do you notice? So I know for me, the first thing I notice is how colorful this image is. Now I'm gonna look all the way at the back of the image and say what I see. So I see these bright yellow, this bright yellow background with all of these stars. What do you see? Does the background tell us anything about where this person is? Maybe not. It looks like maybe someone hung up some fabric behind this person to create this photo. What is the person wearing? Are their clothes or their costume, whatever they have on? What does that tell you about this person? Does it say anything? I see lots of patterns. This person has a lot of accessories. They have a scarf, they have a head wrap, they have a robe on, they have pattern socks. So there's a lot of texture, a lot of layering. And then lastly, how is this person using their body? Can we see all of them? Can we see each of their arms and legs? Can we see their face? How are they posed? Are they sitting? Are they standing? Are they jumping? Where are they looking? When I look at this person, the way that they are posed, the way that they use their body, I think they look quite confident. But that's how I see it. You might see it differently. So all of these things are information that I am noticing, that I am receiving from this photograph. So now we're going to look at the next one. So this is a photo by the same artist. You might notice some similarities. You might notice some things about it that are the same as the last one. But you might notice some things that are really different too. So in the things that are the same, I notice there are still a lot of layers. There are a lot of colors. There are a lot of textures. But I wonder, what's different? What do you notice? What do you notice about the way this person is using their body? Their pose is really different. They're holding something and they're covering their face. How does this photo feel to you? 
how do you think this person feels in this photo? I think maybe this person could be feeling shy. They could be feeling insecure. But when I think about it again, I also think this person could be feeling really silly. They could be feeling really playful. So those are our two images by Hassan Hajjaj. And now we're going to go and look at one more photographer together. These are going to be different photos. They're going to look different because they were taken by a different artist. So what do you notice, take a moment, what do you notice about this photograph? This is a different portrait. I noticed that there are three people. That's more people than, last, than the last photos. I notice that their background is different. It's not like the other backgrounds because this background is a found background. It's not a painting, it's not a piece of fabric, it's just the outside, these pink roses. So when I look at this, I know the photographer didn't create this background, but they chose it. So maybe this is in their yard, maybe they walked around and they found these roses and they wanted to take a picture in front of it. So they chose this background, but they found it in nature. When I look at the people and what they're wearing, they're all in pink and they match. And they're all really close together. They're hugging. So even though I don't know them, I think they might be family. They seem like they really care about each other because they are so connected in the photo. This is what the background, the clothing, and the posing tells me about these people, about this moment. And this is our final photograph that we're gonna look at together. So I want you to notice one more time, just notice what you notice. Speak amongst yourselves, what do you see in this image? So this is also by the last photographer, Aliyah Youssef. So again, we have three people, but it's really different. They're not looking at the camera. All the other pictures, people were, we could see them looking at the camera. Some of these people are turned away. We actually can't really see them. But they're looking at each other. So the last photo, the, the, the people were kind of hugging, which made them feel really connected. In this photo, the, the people are not touching, but I think that they feel connected because they're looking at each other. They look like they're having a conversation and they're smiling a little bit. So they seem like they care about each other. This is what their body language is telling us when we look at this photo. We know they're outside because of their background, of the green grass. So you might have noticed lots of different things when you looked at these photographs. Now we're gonna use these photographs as inspiration for our own photographs. And like I said before, I really think that noticing is the base of photography. So when you walk around your house or maybe even your neighborhood, you are going to notice things. You're going to notice the, the flowers. You're going to notice the patterns of the fabrics in your home or the colors of your wall or the colors of the wall outside your house. And these things can spark your creativity um, you might notice these kinds of backgrounds all around you and things you might want to take photos in front of. So in order to think through these projects, let's set up our photo studio. It will look, you know, kind of like this photo of this person with the camera. So I'm going to show you how to use your phone um, as inside of a homemade tripod um, and I'll explain a little bit, which is, I think that using a tripod can be really helpful, especially when you're using your phone. Um, I think that it allows the phone to feel more like a camera. So instead of, um, it's, 
if, you're, if your phone is in a tripod, it's harder to play a game or respond to texts. And so those distracting elements of using a phone um, are not as distracting, in my opinion, when, when you can um, put it in a tripod. Um, it just sort of takes the phone away from its phoneness and, and makes it feel more like a physical camera. Um, which I think can be really helpful for kids, but also for adults, because sometimes we really just want to grab our phone and respond to our texts, respond to our emails. Um, it can get really distracting. So if you put your phone in a solid spot, it's harder to be distracted by it, I think. So this is the smartphone tripod. Um, I'm going to go through this, these descriptions, you know, sort of briefly, but all of this information is in um, the full steps are detailed in your PDF handout that you get with this webinar. So if you can see in the photo, that is my little homemade phone tripod. So you can buy tripods for, that, are, that are for use with phones. Um, you don't need to though. Um, if you already have one, that's cool. Like you should use that with your family. Um, but this is just a way to make one. If you do not have one, this is very easy. And then the actual making of it can become part of your craft and art project that you're doing with your kids. It can really just extend the process um, and add some physical creation within the technology of making a photo. So, you know, it's great that our smartphones and their cameras are always with us. They can be distracting. They can be hard to hold steady um, for kids or people with, you know, physical challenges where maybe your grip isn't as good or you shake a little bit or whatever it is um, that might make holding a phone still or a camera still um, more challenging. There are so many ways around that. Um, and one of them is just using a tripod. So to make this tripod, this is my little example. You can see it in the, in the photo. It's just cardboard um, cut out of a box. So let's say you have a box, you get a package. This, the sides of the box have these top and bottom flaps. You just cut a piece off. You'll see it in the PDF. I'll go to the next slide. You cut a piece off and you fold it. You don't even have to do any measuring or anything. You fold it, you put tape to hold it in this triangle shape. And then you cut notches. There's not even any measuring, honestly. You just, you just place your phone, you find out where it goes, and then you cut about an inch down these notches, and then your phone will just sit inside of the cardboard. And now your camera is free, and you can use your phone. You can place it wherever, you can use this to sort of take like, photos of yourself because the, you know, the phone is, can stand on its own and you can better position where it goes. Um, this is, I'm not going to go into self timer, but if you, um, every smartphone pretty much has a self timer feature on an iPhone. This is what the button looks like. Um, feel free, you know, if you have a different kind of phone, you can, you can look it up online. Um, if you need support finding the self timer, but pretty much every phone has a self timer. So now we're going to go into utilizing storytelling elements. So the things that we just pulled from those photos, the things we were noticing, um, because now we can start adding to our photo space. So we have our camera, our phone or our camera set up, you know, in theory, <laughs> you don't need to set up your phone camera right now, but, um, you know, later when you work on these projects, uh, so you're gonna set up your, your camera space and it's going to be pointing at something. And then we need to think about what these portraits are that we're making. So we're gonna focus on backgrounds, accessories, which is what I'm calling like clothing or props, and poses. So backgrounds. We looked at these images. There were two kinds of backgrounds in these images. The first one, the roses here on the left, that's a found background, it's natural. It still demonstrates a choice 
by the photographer. So even though the, the person who made this photo didn't create that background, they didn't draw it, they didn't paint it, they didn't hang it up, they found it. They walked around until they saw something that excited them and they chose that as their background. On the right, we have a created background, something staged, something altered by the photographer. So they, I, I, I know that this photographer uses these rolls of fabrics, um, even sometimes like wall, like wrapping paper, these patterned papers, um, and he hangs them up on a wall outside actually, but you could do it anywhere inside your home. Um, and he takes these photos of people in front of it. So that person is creating a background, but both of these are choices, whether it's a found background or a created background that the photographer is making. So you want to encourage your children to, um, really think about what the background is going to be when they're taking these photos, even if they're not creating it themselves. So talking about backgrounds, now we have an activity. So this is about the simplest way you could do, you could create a background. Um, on your PDF, there are several um, activities for creating a background, different ideas. Um, and, but we're, we're gonna go over one right now. So this is about as simple as it comes. You can see in the photo, this child has, is a very young child. They have colored on this paper, just scribbled on it however they want, and they're hanging it up. And then what you would do is, you know, the per whatever you're photographing would stand in front of this background, this created background. So this is, you know, really as, as simple as it gets, which is just, using a huge piece of paper or however big you have, coloring on it, drawing on it, painting on it, and then hanging it up behind the person um, to create the background of the image. So then whatever stands in front of that background, whoever stands in front of that background, will have this artwork behind it. Um, this is especially, yeah, really useful for really young kids who are not as interested, the photo might be, for really young kids, the photo might be the quickest part. You know, the photo takes one second. It might not be as exciting. So building up the elements of the photo, um, you know, taking the time to like draw this background um, and get creative in these more physical ways, especially for younger children, um, will help them engage with the photo process more. And will extend, you know, extend the photo process. So we just looked at backgrounds. Now we're gonna talk about accessories. So accessories is the word that I've, that I've chosen to use, but what I mean is the things in the photo that the person is wearing or holding. Um, so the idea behind accessories is what story does the clothing, the accessories, or the costuming tell? Are there any props that tell us more about the photo or about the people in the photo. So we talked about this family in pink. They all have this matching scarf on. So that unites them and it makes them feel really connected to me as a viewer. I think that they feel really connected to each other because there's this visual reference that's the same on each of them. And it looks like they thought about it. It looks like they wanted to look connected, right? Maybe they really enjoy matching. So that clothing item tells me that story. And then for the photo on the right, um, I'm thinking less about the person's clothing and more about the prop that they're holding. So the vase of flowers. Um, they're holding it in front of their face, which is telling us a lot. You know, we don't know, we're going to interpret it through our own ideas, but it's telling us something, you know? This person has chosen, or the photographer has chosen for this person to pose in this way, for these flowers to be in front of their face. So that's giving us all of this information about the way that person might be feeling or what they wanna look like, um, or how they want this photo to look. 
And if they had chosen something really different other than flowers, we might feel differently about it. It might look completely different. If they were holding a mask up, well, then that would change everything about the way this photo looks, right? So there's just different elements that you can talk about with your kids and also that you can bring into photo making to extend that process of, oh, we're just, just snapping a photo. No, we're not just snapping a photo. We're thinking about what goes behind us, what goes on the person, what are they holding, what are the objects around them, um, and thinking about it in the way of telling a story. So in that vein, the activity that um, we'll talk about for thinking about accessories, um, I call this personality portraits. This is actually a really lovely thing um, for anyone to do. Uh, so the main, it begins with thinking about and writing down qualities you love about yourself and about your personality. So are you kind? Are you creative? Write down whatever comes to mind. For older kids, um, you can set like a one to two minute timer and just have them write for themselves what they um, view as positive traits about themselves. Um, and adults do it too, um, next to your child. If your child is much younger, then obviously you talk it through with them and you, you know, you'll do the writing and maybe you'll You'll talk even more about like what, you know, what makes up a person, what is a personality, you know, what are these parts of ourselves that um, make us unique. Um, for little kids, it might be more concrete. It might be like, oh, my favorite color or my best friend. Um, and that's okay. Wherever your child is at, just think about these things together. So you're going to write down all these qualities that you see as positive that you love about yourself. Um, once you have that list, you're going to look it over and each person will choose one quality on the list. You know, circle it, keep it in mind. And then the activity is to create a photograph of yourself that communicates that quality. Um, you can use your imagination to represent these qualities visually. So these are just photos, you know, free stock photos from the internet, but I like to think that, you know, if these people were doing this project, maybe the person in black and white on the top, that person might have thought, well, my music skills, um, my love of music is one of my favorite qualities. So they, they would create this self-portrait using the guitar as the prop, you know, using the way that they're using their body, they're smiling, um, these things to show that quality to us. Um, the children at the bottom, maybe that older sibling wants to show that they are loving, that they are um, a teacher for their younger sibling, and maybe that's what they wanted to show, that they're a good big sister. Um, and so then they would take that photograph. So you can really get creative. Um, it's quite fun uh, because you can bring in so many elements. You can change your clothes, you can change your background, you can change your body language um, when you're creating these images. And if you wanna do it together as a group, if you do it separately, but you could also just do it together um, and each person is, just, is showing off their personality, um, but in the same photo. So this is the last thing we're gonna talk about. We already did backgrounds. We did accessories or clothing. Um, now we're gonna do poses. So poses is just, what are the people doing in the photo? How are they using their bodies? What is their facial expression, right? These people are using their bodies very differently. It might involve, you know, are they looking at the camera? Are they not looking at the camera? Are they looking at each other? Are they jumping? Are they running? Are they sitting? You know, all of these, encompass the pose of the person. So this is our last um, activity example for this workshop. There's more on your PDF, but this is the last one for today on here. So I'm calling this pose practice. The idea being that, um, especially with younger kids or with kids who you want to incorporate um, emotional, social emotional learning, like you want your child to explore um, 
the words or the expressions for different emotions. Um, I know, especially with little kids or kids on the spectrum, um, we really want to, they're learning about emotions. They're learning about the ways that people's bodies and faces um, explain how they feel. So um, this project is simply, you know, you have your photo set up, um, practice, talk about words for different emotions and expressions. Use new words that maybe you don't know, your child doesn't know yet um, or is working on. So things like surprise, joy, loneliness, contentment. These are words that can be more specific than, you know, happy, sad, things like that. So practice, you know, the person behind the camera will give that, give the person in front of the camera um, a prompt. They'll say, show me joy, show me contentment, you know, and then that person has to recreate it on their face with their body, um, however they see fit. And then you take those photos, capture them with your camera, and then I would encourage you to look at the, the finished photos together with your child. And you could even make a game of it later, especially for younger children, where later you look at the photos and you try to remember what, what feeling was this person showing in this image and see if you can remember or see if you can um, come up with even maybe new words for those feelings. So those are our activities. Um, I have this slide that I'm calling final tips. Um, my, it's sort of a summary in a way of like, these, these are the tips that you should take with you when doing any of the activities that we just went through um, or any of the activities on your PDF. Um, I would say, remember to take turns and let your child photograph you. So I think that children get photographed all the time, and it could be different in your home. Um, for me, I feel like parents are often photographing their children. Parents are usually the ones who have the phone or who have the camera. Um, part of that's just practical, they're the adults. Um, but I think it can be really special and really um, exciting to flip the switch, um, take turns, and let your child photograph you um, without feeling um without letting any feelings about oh what will i look like um or any insecurities um of your own um show through of course sometimes we feel vulnerable having our photo taken but um letting your child take the reins um can be really fun you know let your child encourage your child to lead you to choose the location for the photo or to create the backdrop. Encourage your child to style your outfit. Maybe they could go through your things and, and put some you know, uh, creative, creative outfits together for you. That could be a really fun activity. And then they would get to direct your pose as well. Are they going to tell you to sit or stand or dance or you know, how do they want you to be in the photo? Because again, we're talking about photography at its base being something, being, no, being the act of noticing, of observing, of seeing. So letting your child take complete control um, in photographing you, they're giving you a gift. They're, you're letting their voice shine by giving them the chance to show you what they notice about the world and what they notice about you, what they care about about you. So it's really fun um, if we just kind of let go and let our kids see us. And it can be really silly and it can be really fun. So also I wanna say, make sure to get a photograph together. Um, one of the most fun parts about this is that you're doing it together and you're able to you want to memorialize that. You want to keep that memory because ultimately photography is about collecting these moments and about um, document documenting parts of our lives. So you want to, you will, I think that it's really wonderful to get a photo together um, while you're doing these projects and um, experiencing this sort of silliness and creativity in your home. Um, I think it'll be really special to keep a photograph of the two of you um, or who, you know, the whole family, whoever is working together. So now, um, actually, we can do questions. Um, 
yeah, we're going to go into questions um, time. Um, I think I'm going to need to stop sharing my screen in order to be able to see the um, questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A and in the chat box. Um, I can answer some other questions right now. If anything, um, if you come up with anything uh, while I'm talking, please feel free. We have until, um, we have another 20 minutes. So any questions that come up for you, please, you have plenty of time. You can put them in the chat box. I think also I'm able to answer a few questions after um, if you email them uh, to the, through the, um, the program's site. So, um, hopefully um, that was informative and there's more in the uh, PDF. Um, and I hope you, yeah, you take um, the skills we talked about um, with you and just have fun creating with your child. Okay, so one question I have is, how do you see this benefiting children who have disabilities, um, children with special needs? So I will say that I see photography as extremely beneficial um, because there, it's can be a very useful physical adaptation. So there's a lot of art making that requires physicality. So, um, you need to be able to hold a brush maybe to paint. There's so many ways to adapt everything, but you know, there's some things like drawing or painting where um, your motor skills and your like uh, muscle tone and your ability to hold on to an object and manipulate it um, dictates how much you can do in that medium. Excuse me, so sniffly. Um, so I think with photography, um, because you can set up a camera and then dictate the space in front of the camera, and a lot of it's just about seeing, um, the physical limitations of fine motor skills are not as relevant. Um, the child, you know, if you have a child with physical, um, disabilities who might have difficulty like holding, yeah, these like smaller objects, um, they can still direct where the camera goes. You could support them um, and help them to set up the camera, the phone camera, wherever. Um, and they can, and then you could even press the button, but they still get to make all these decisions. Um, I've also worked with a lot of children who use um, iPads as communication devices um, and they use the iPad to you know verbally communicate they press buttons for words but the other benefit is that their iPad takes pictures so they're able to take pictures of the things important to them the people important to them either at school and then they get to bring it home and say, oh look, the, you know, here's the people that I see all day and who I care about. And then the other way around too, where they get to take pictures of the things in their lives at home and they get to show up at, you know, school or wherever they are and say, oh look, look through my iPad. You know, this is my communication device. I have it with me at all times, but it's also a way for me to, you know, show you what's important to me via like the photos that I'm storing. Um, and taking with this device. So, um, yeah, I see a lot of use with uh, photography and physical adaptations um, and children with disabilities. Um, I would love to know the ways that, you know, you might be ad adapting processes and photo for your children. Um, I think there's a lot of possibility there. So another question that I have is what to do with your finished photographs. 
So there's a lot you can do with your finished photos. I think it's dep it depends on who you are, but I find that most people don't print photos as much anymore because technology is so, um, we have so much technology now and we have so many ways of taking photos and so many ways of sharing photos on the internet. So we don't tend to print our photos as much as we used to, maybe when I was growing up or when you were growing up, if you're, you know, a parent. So I think that I would say print out your photos if you're able, especially when you're doing these activities with your children and especially for younger children. Um, they, it's exciting to create something and then have it become an object because also if it gets, if it's just in your phone, if it's just on the internet, especially for the younger children, they don't have access to it in the same way that you do. They're not, they, you know, they might need to, oh, mommy, can I, can I look at that photo again? And then you have to pull out your phone. But if you print it out, even just on, you know, a basic printer, it doesn't have to be a fancy, um, you know, photo studio print. You can just print it out on your, you know, a basic, like, computer printer even. Just creating, turning that art object, that photo your you and your child made together, turning that into a physical object, into something that they can hold and look at or even color on if they really want to, you know, cut it out. That physicality of the photo really changes the whole process um, and it creates, I mean, it just creates a physical art object for your child and then they can do with it whatever they want. Do they have you know, a photo album they can put it into? Do they have like a frame in their room? Can they hang it up? Um, it just changes their relationship to photography when they get to have a physical printout of the thing that they made um, and get to, you know, maybe even further alter it or um, create more from it, which is all, you know, possibilities. Um, and also, if you, if you are really interested in what to do with your printed photos and ways to make art with these printed photos, um, there will be an, um, our next webinar, my next webinar next week, um, we're going to go into that and I'll, expl I'll tell you about our, the other webinars um, in a moment. So another question I have is, um, what is the benefit of using a phone or what if I want to use a real camera? You can definitely use a real camera. Um, real camera. I mean, they're all real cameras, but by real camera, I just mean a camera whose only function is to take photos versus something like a phone, which has many functions. So um, the benefit of using a phone is just that you always have it. Um, I think that kids are really familiar with it, mostly, um, in my experience. Um, and I think that adults are using their phones all the time. And when you, it, it gives you a chance to kind of put the phone down. You can't talk or text or get distracted if you're actually using it as the camera. Um, but also it gives kids a chance to use something they're really familiar with. But on the other hand, if you have a camera and you want to teach your child to use it, go for it. Um, that's great too. Um, I just wanted to stress, the reason I stress using the phone is because it's just so accessible. We all have it, even if we don't consider ourselves photographers, we're not using photo a lot. Um, we still, so many of us have these, these ways of taking pictures. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to teach your child to use a camera that you have at home, that's great. Um, they can certainly, I'd say go for it. Um, and one more question, which is, how would you adapt these processes for older or younger kids? So when you look at your PDF, there's several different um, activities. And I think that um, it will be quite clear, which I think that it's very simple. I think it's very possible to adapt all of these projects to both older and younger kids. So depending on your child's um, interest level, older kids will naturally just kind of do more. Um, they will be more interested in multi-step processes. Um, they will want to 
create a little bit longer. Younger children tend to be really quick. You know, a three-year-old wants to color something, they're gonna do 10 little scribbles maybe, and then they're done. Um, so with younger kids, um, it's kind of like a process where you just kind of keep it moving um, and keep things really simple. For older kids, it'll just get more complex. It'll get more complex. And older kids, especially with photography, can start to create images of themselves um, more. They can have more independence. Um, of course, I want you to connect as a family, but you know, an older child, you know, I mean, eight is not so very old, but if they want to work a little bit more independently, oh, they want to set up their own photo shoot with themselves, of course, you know, you're right there. But um, there's always a chance for more independent um, photo taking. Um, let's see, what else? Um, when it comes to like creating backdrops, um, you know, younger children are going to paint or draw um, maybe really abstractly. Um, older kids might have a stronger vision. They might want to create um, more specifically, like um, utilizing, either creating a certain, um, drawing a scene or painting a scene um, versus just scribbling, right? Um, so a lot of the processes within these activities that lead you to taking the photo. So creating the back, background, um, choosing the, the outfit, playing around with poses, all of these activities um, just add more physical like crafting and like art process to the photos. So to the photo making. So I mean, every child, these are, but these are really like common things that we do. We scribble when we're little, we draw, we play dress up, we get dressed every day. Um, we notice things about the world around us. Like these are things that kids of all ages can interact with. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is just kind of creating structure for your child, creating structure within the idea of an activity. Here are the steps, here's what we're gonna do. But within those steps, there's a lot of freedom. So I really want you to think about just kind of letting your child lead, um, giving them the space to experience those creative activities, giving them the space to make decisions within those processes. Um, and I think that children will mostly rise um, to their own level and they'll kind of, you know, push you where they, where they feel comfortable. So, um, you know, if they're comfortable adding more layers to something, doing it for longer, things like that, um, I think it will be easy to follow their lead. Um, that is all the time for questions. I'm going to pull up my slides really quick just because I'm going to show you um, my last, um, I just wanna show you the next workshops I have going on. Uh, so I'll just leave you with this visual really quick. So these are the next webinars that I have happening. Um, so this workshop we did today, Photography in the Family, was part one. We're going to do next week, next Thursday, um, Photography in the Family, part two, Creating Photo Albums. Uh, it's going to be at 6 p.m. your time, uh, 10 a.m. in New York. And then, um, so that will be a continuation. We're going to talk about what we do once we print our photos out, which will be really fun. So it'll be really different. Um, it's not about conceptualizing the photo, but about um, creating things with our finished photos. And then um, the last workshop I'm going to be doing on October 1st is Textile Tactile Weaving Together. So that will be a very um, more sensory physical workshop where we are literally weaving, creating um, projects 
So um, great for children who are looking for something hands-on, um, really want to create something physical. There's a lot of sensory um, experiences within that workshop. Um, so those are the ones, you know, I'm, I would love to see you again. I, well, I can't see you, of course, but I would love if you joined me again, especially if you um, enjoyed this workshop. You don't, for the second Photography in the Family workshop, you do not have to have attended this one. So if you, have, if you know other families who are looking to go to the second workshop, don't worry, you don't have to have come to this one. Um, it will be a separate workshop, despite the fact that it is, you know, also dealing with similar ideas. Um, and I just, I hope you, I hope you get to go to lots of other workshops. I hope you gain so much um, information and knowledge from these processes. Um, it's really special to be able to chat with you today um, and be able to um, come into your homes um, and teach you um, what I know about um, creating photo moments with children. Um, I hope you get to use some of these processes and I hope um, this has been educational um, or you know has sparked some curiosity in you about photo making um, and about creating together. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of all I have. Um, we're maybe like a couple minutes shy. Um, but yeah, uh, any questions that come to mind? I think there's a couple days um, that I can still respond to questions if you if you think of something later today and you get it into the into the program email. Um, but yeah, I hope that you um, have a good time creating. Um, and you know, photography begins with noticing. It begins with observing the world around us, observing the people in our lives, and choosing to preserve these moments, preserve um, snapshots of what we see, what we witness about the world. So, um, you know, just go out and take photos with your child and, and create these magical, these magical play moments together. It's all you can really do. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Um, I hope I will see you at my next workshop. And until then, happy creating. Thank you.